have a risen Savior, don't we? Amen. Christ is risen, right? Christ is risen indeed. And uh, we, thank, uh, we thank God the Father for that. We thank the Lord that we don't have a dead Savior. What, what good would a dead Savior be? And uh, there is a real purpose in the resurrection, and that, that's actually the title of my message this morning. First of all, I want to say this. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Israel, about two weeks ago. And, uh, and, it, and it's really fun. You go to Israel, you, you, you see all of these sites. And by the way, they, uh, I'm not real happy with what they've done with all the sites because they're, mon- they're basically uh, monetizing every Christian site that's out there, every site that you go to. And I maybe mentioned this uh, a couple weeks ago. But uh, every site you go to, there's just droves of people everywhere. And it all costs money to see a Christian site. Right? There's a lot of hype. About, the, about going to a site and, and there's somebody, there's peddlers, there's gift shops, and they've planned the gift shops just right, by the way. You go into a site, and we were joking about this. We were joking about this. When you go to Israel, you go into a site, you see all the sites and you get your tour, and then you have to exit through the gift shop. <laughs> I mean, they do this on purpose. They trap you. They like know how to market, right? And sometimes that bothers me. That bothers me a little bit. Because here's why, here's why. There's more to... There's more to Israel and there's more to the Christian faith than just uh, monetizing a Christian site. I want to go to the site and I want to I be there in that site. When we went to the Garden of Gethsemane, it was a beautiful place in the Mount of Olives. And I, I tell you, there weren't, there weren't less probably than 5,000 people filling the streets, probably... I don't know, 30 buses, 30 coach buses. We're not talking like these little short buses. We're talking big, massive buses. And they're all getting off the bus, and they all want to see the Garden of Gethsemane. And then the same thing you see outside of the Garden Tomb. The Garden Tomb is really special because you walk into this, into this, uh, into this tomb, or into this uh, uh, garden area, and you walk over and you see this hill, this, uh, this hill Golgotha, and you make your way down kind of this big sweeping loop, and, and, and you go by this, these big cisterns that are in the ground, which would prove that it is, in fact, a garden. And then you come up to this, um, come up to this tomb. It's in, the, um, it's in, a, in a hillside. It's chiseled and carved. The rock is all chiseled and broken. Now, since, uh, since it's been... Uh, excavated, and, and since so many Christians are going there, the, the door, the entrance has now become round because everybody wants to touch the tomb as they walk into this tomb. And as you go into this tomb, you're, you're, really, you're really transported back 2,000 years. You're transported back 2,000 years as you step into this tomb and your mind floods with all these, with all these pictures of the disciples even coming in to just check and see to make sure that the body isn't there. And as you, as you begin to, as you turn to your right, you see this, uh, see this stone uh, bed, basically. Now it's all got the, all these bars that kind of keep people from actually touching the bed, but you can walk in and you see this, this bed, this place where Jesus had once laid. And you transport her back 2,000 years when Jesus came back from the grave. And as you begin to just do a, a, a simple survey, I mean, the, the whole tomb area is probably no bigger than this platform. This platform is not very big. And, and you begin to look in this, in this platform, and, and, and you turn around, and you see on, this, on, on, on the wall, and I showed you the picture of, of the sign that says, He is not here, He is risen. And you just, you, you have an overwhelming sense of joy. Knowing that our Savior is no longer in the grave. I want to read you a passage this morning. Probably one of the most clear, concise passages in Scripture about that resurrection morning. And then I want to give you three purposes for the resurrection. Let me read this. Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 to 10. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. 
And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. They were the first ones to investigate the tomb. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. You can imagine, for just a moment, fear and great joy coming from those two ladies as they were departing from an empty tomb. Both with fear and great joy. And they did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by their feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. I don't know if you, can, if you did imagination games when you were a kid. I don't know if you ever imagined for a moment that... Uh, You were a little princess, right? This is for the ladies. The men, you were little kings. (laughs) The kings and queens or whatever. Princes and princesses. Or maybe you did the cowboys and Indian thing, right? Now, apparently that's not like PC anymore. Cowboys and Indians, apparently. Uh, We still, I would still, I mean, I don't know. I'd still be a cowboy. I mean, (laughs) I'm just saying. Because I got the gun. It has nothing to do with, you know, I got the gun. Cowboys and Indians. And if you could imagine for just a moment these two ladies as they have this confrontation with this wonderful angel. And this angel actually rolls back the stone and then sits upon the stone. Amazing. Amazing. You can, if you were in their shoes for just a moment, or sandals, <laughs> if you were in their bare feet, If you were in their bare feet, what what would you do? Would you be just elated that the Savior, that you go into this tomb, you stoop down and you look in there and there's no body? Literally, there's no body and there's no body. Nobody in there. I don't know if you can imagine that. When you're in the garden tomb area and when you actually see that tomb, if you have not gone to Israel, if there I would spend five thousand dollars just to go see the empty tomb. It's amazing. I want to give you three real quick purposes. Finding purpose in the resurrection. Number one, the resurrection proves Jesus is God. Number two, the resurrection provides hope for the believer. And three, the resurrection protects our faith. So it proves Jesus is God, it provides hope for the believer, and it protects our faith. Let's look real quickly at proving that Jesus is is God. Romans 1, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Friends, if Jesus isn't God, then he isn't our Savior. If Jesus is not God, he's not our Savior. In fact, the Jesus who died was our Savior, and this is important to the, to the Judeo-Christian faith. If we don't know for sure, if we don't know for sure that Jesus actually is God, then we have a problem, don't we? We have a problem because if he is not God, then he can't save us from our sins because only God can save us from our sins. The resurrection authenticates Jesus. It authenticates Jesus. It authenticates that the fact that he is God, that he is God in the flesh. Jesus foretold about his resurrection. He told his disciples in Matthew 16, 21, for that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. As a matter of fact, if Jesus didn't raise on the third day but rose on the fifth day, then he wouldn't fulfill prophecy and he wouldn't, he wouldn't be God. When we look at When we look at what we believe to be true about God today, 
When we think about Easter, when we think about Passover, when we think about Christ coming back from the grave, you understand that this is, this is important to prove who Jesus was? Without this, we have nothing. If Jesus isn't God, then we have a problem. And that's why in the world you hear all of these, these, these nonsensical ideas like, well, Jesus was a good man. Problem, he wasn't just a good man. Because if he was just a good man and not God, then he can't save us from our sin. We have a problem. Only God can save us from our sin. So when people say, well, there are many ways to go to heaven. Problem, there can only be one way. There's only one God, to, right? There can't be two gods. If there were two gods, the bigger God would destroy the little God. So there can only be one God. There can't be two ways or three ways or a multitude of roads. There can only be one way. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's it. It has to be Jesus and Jesus only. There aren't multiple ways. And, 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 it's, and it's sad to see society going this way, to have all of these different ideas of salvation. Jesus spoke of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Without the resurrection, it, does, it proves he wasn't God. Without the resurrection, without that, it proves that he wasn't God. Listen, friends, it wasn't the miracles he did. It wasn't the miracles that Jesus did. Listen, there were other people that did miracles. In Acts chapter 5, Peter did miracles. He did so many miracles that, that people would would. would, would Pass by hoping that his shadow would overshadow them and be healed. In Acts 19, the Apostle Paul, I mean, he did so many miracles that he had these like handkerchiefs that healed people, like parts of his clothes that healed people. It wasn't the miracles, it was the resurrection. It was the miracle. Because Jesus, who is God, imparted on his disciples the ability to do miracles ultimately to authenticate who he was. It was the resurrection that proves that he is God. There are some really important fundamental truths in the scripture. This is one of them. It proves that Jesus is God. Secondly, it proves, or I'm sorry, it provides hope for the believer. The resurrection provides hope for the believer. Listen to this in 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. By what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. One commentator said this, Peter used the word living six times. Here, in this passage, living means that the believer's hope is sure, it's certain, it's real as opposed to the deceptive, empty, false hope that the world has to offer. The fact is, is Jesus' resurrection gives us a living hope. A hope that is so much different than what the world has to offer. The world has no hope. You understand that? The world has no hope. That is why, that is why the world... In times of trouble, they turn to God. They turn to God in time of trouble because there's no hope out there. And, and, and this, is why, this is why they blame God for when there is trouble because their hope doesn't have an answer to this, which is no hope. You see, Friends, the problem with the world's hope is it's full of empty promises. It's full of empty promises. He hath said in his heart, listen to this, he hath said in his heart that I will not seek after God. He's not going to seek after God because he says, because he shall never be in adversity. The reason, the reason that the unbeliever, the reason that the world doesn't seek after God who has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. This is it. 
This is the reason. He says, I shall not be moved because I shall never be in adversity. See, the world, the world's hope, the world's hope is like this. I don't need to change because I'm not going to be in any trouble. That's what he says. I don't need to change because I'm not going to be in any trouble. And the reality is, is they are in deep trouble. And they have an empty hope. They have an empty hope. And the world loves the things of the world. But the Bible says in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not him. Don't love the things of the world. Why? Because it's empty. It provides no hope. There's no hope in the things of the world. There's only hope in Christ. He even says in Romans 15, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. See, Paul knew that the only hope, the only hope was that we should be moved, that we do seek after God. See, the resurrection provides a living hope hope for us. We have a living hope. Something that makes sense. Something that has substance to it. Unfortunately, the world doesn't have that sort of hope. This is, this is exactly why they, they, they fill their lives with all sorts of worthlessness. Don't they? All sorts of things that don't matter. Things to fill the empty hole. They're trying to put something there to fill the hole that, won't, that has no substance. And we have a living hope. It provides hope for the believer. The resurrection protects our faith. 1 Corinthians 15 says, And if Christ be not risen, if he's not risen from the grave, listen to this, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain, and our faith is also vain. The resurrection protects our faith, from being empty, worthless, of no value. See, believing, believing in him, that he is risen from the dead, that he is risen from the grave, it adds substance to our faith, and it affirms it, and it makes it real. People who say, well, it's not really that important that Jesus actually rose from the grave, we have another problem. The problem is, is that if he had been, if he's not risen, then, then our preaching's in vain, then what I'm doing now is worthless, and what you believe in is worthless. He has to have had come back from the grave. The tomb has to be empty. And this is exactly the reason why the world tries so hard to substantiate the fact that he didn't come back from the grave. Why they try to minimize the resurrection. Years ago, I've mentioned this a couple years ago, they mentioned uh, that they, they had this ossuary box with the name of Jesus inscription on it. And they said, here, look, here lies the bones of Jesus. Eh, wrong again. There are at least two people in this room named Brian. And on a good Sunday, there's going to be three or four. And you know what? Jesus was, uh, he was the only person who didn't, he, it's not like, there was nobody named Jesus in that day. They found an ossuary box named Jesus, yes. But was it Jesus, the Christ, the, the, the man of Galilee? No, it wasn't. It couldn't have been because if it had been, if it had been, then guess what? My preaching's in vain and your faith is in vain. Then why are we here in church? Why are there any churches, any Christian churches in all of America? If Jesus is not risen from the grave then our faith is in vain. So, listen, not only, not only does it protect our faith, because it does protect our faith, it also gives us hope, and it also proves that Jesus is God. And without those components, now, the resurrection does a whole lot more than just those three things, by the way. These are just three things I gave you. The resurrection is powerful. And you know, it's the only faith, in the, it's the only religion in the world that has a resurrected Savior. There's, there's not another religion out there that has, a, that has a risen Savior. And we sing this song. 
I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Wow. How amazing is it to know that the God that we have in heaven is someone we communicate here with on earth? We, we just, we, we talk to God in prayer, don't we? We ask him things. And we can tell the Lord that we love him. We can share our faith and not be ashamed. Right? We, we don't have to be ashamed of our faith. Every other religion has to be ashamed at least a little bit because their God is dead. They claim he's God, but wasn't God enough to raise himself from the dead. And we have a Savior that is risen and is in the world today. Now that's amazing. The resurrection is vital to the Christian faith. It's vital. Now I'm going to show you this. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. I'm going to show you how important the resurrection is. Here we are with all of our sin. I showed this to a guy the other day. I uh, met him in a garage, and his name was Bob, and I showed him this wallet illustration, just like I show you guys every Sunday. Here we are with our sin. The Bible says that we all have this sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Everyone in this room is a sinner. Every single one of us. Me included. And the Bible says that we have a penalty that we have to pay for the sin. There's a, there's a wage. And the Bible says in, 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 uh, in Romans chapter 6, it says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for this sin. That's the problem right there. That's the problem because I, I, the only thing that I can offer is my life and I'm going to be separated from God because if I have to pay for my sin in eternity, I'm not going to be in eternity with God. So where am I going to be? In an eternity in hell. Because I cannot, with my sin, be in the presence of a holy God. It doesn't work that way. So I'm going to have to pay for my sin and be absent from God forever. That's the problem. The solution is is what we call the good news. The solution is, is the good news that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he came to this earth and he died on the cross. Now watch this, watch this. He died on the cross and he made the payment for your sin debt. Now this is the best part. Ready for this? He died and was buried. But now if he is dead and buried, he gives you something that means nothing. If he, if, if he is powerless to come back from the grave, what power does he have to impart to you righteousness? If he is dead in a grave somewhere, never coming back, what power, is, what power does he have? Is he even God? If he can't come back from the grave, he has promised you something he can't fulfill. You know what makes this all work? is the resurrection that he came back from the grave and he proved that he was in fact the sinless son of God and that he had the power to be able to make a payment for your sin debt see there's a lot of churches there's a lot of churches this is what I told Bob yesterday I said there's a lot of churches that tell you to turn over a new leaf problem is is you still have the sin debt that has to be paid for there's a lot of churches that say um that say if you get water baptized, you get water baptized. Some churches say if you give money to the church or if you walk an aisle, they have people come forward and they walk an aisle. Some people say that if you join a church, you become a church member. Problem is, is here you are with your sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, not church membership, not walking an aisle or giving money or praying a prayer. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for your sin. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin debt. He was buried in a grave. And he rose three days later to prove that what he says about you and the faith that, or the, 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 the uh, gift that he gives you, which is salvation, is certain. And the Bible says this. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves but it's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. 
Salvation is a gift received by faith. When you trust, depend, rely upon Jesus alone as your Savior, that's it. Salvation is not meant to be complicated. It's not meant to be tough. Salvation is simple.